I'm Adrian Seed and this is Nightline. News making the headlines. Construction of five LCS underway, BNS committed to complete project. And 300,000 high-skilled job opportunities to be created by 2025. Thanks for joining us. Bowstead Naval Shipyard Syndrome Berhad BNS is committed to completing the construction of six Royal Malaysian Navy Littoral Combat Ships LCS. Its Chief Executive Officer, Engineer Asha Jumaat, said five LCS were being built concurrently with the first ship at the 60% completion stage. The other four ships were being built at 48%, 43%, 36%, and 22% completion stages, respectively. However, construction has yet to begin on the sixth ship. We, we have stated that the first ship is already at the, uh, the stage of 60% completion. This is what we actually declared to the cabinet uh, as in April this year. You have seen uh, five ships under, under construction in various stages of completion and also about 1.7 billion equipment system in the store. Uh, in our warehouses. He pointed out that most of the equipment stored in warehouses are not obsolete as claimed and are still usable for the project. He added that the claims were not entirely accurate as some are in the obsolescence phase and not obsolete yet. He also denied on reports made by the Public Accounts Committee, PAC, on the LCS project that 15% of the equipment stored at warehouses had become obsolete. ASA pointed out that a total of 1.7 billion ringgit of equipment and systems acquired are stored for a long period in the warehouse, as it requires preservation and maintenance while in storage. He noted that all the equipment are certified and not obsolete and can be used 25 years from now. Meanwhile, Dato Sri Hishamuddin Tun Hussein reiterated the government's commitment in putting the LCS project back on track as decided by the cabinet. The senior defence minister in his Facebook posting on Saturday said negotiations with vendors, original equipment manufacturers and banks are being carried out. He also shared pictures of the media's visit to Bowsted Naval Shipyard in Lumut Pera on Saturday to take a look at the external and internal conditions of the LCS which is under construction. He also asserted that he, together with the Defence Ministry, had nothing to hide and the wrongdoers must be brought to justice. The government is looking into a proposal to lift the ban on the export of chicken. Prime Minister Dato Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob said poultry breeders had made an application to the government to review the ban on chicken export. Jadi kita akan bincang. Kalau rasa kita boleh benarkan ekspor dan dari segi supply di dalam negara tidak berkurangan kerana ekspor tersebut mungkin kita boleh timbangkan untuk review balik dari segi ekspor. Ini tengah dibincangkan. Datuk Seri Ronald akan bentangkan secara detail berapa jumlah pengeluaran akhir bulan depan adakah akan beri kesan kalau kita lepaskan ekspor dan sebagainya. Dato Sri Ismail Sabri said this after visiting the Pahang Pavilion at the 2022 Malaysia Agriculture, Horticulture and Agro-Tourism Maha Exhibition at the Malaysia Agro-Exposition Park Serdang on Saturday. He added that the government feared that by allowing 3.6 million chickens to be exported a month, the supply in the country will be affected. This will lead to a price hike because the demand exceeds supply. The Prime Minister also said that the Agriculture and Food Industries Ministry was ordered to look into the details on the chicken output projection for next month. Meanwhile, Dato Sri Ismail Sabri said the data and cybersecurity breach involving online payment solution provider IPay88 will be discussed in the Cabinet. The Prime Minister said it follows a proposal mooted to establish a Royal Commission of Inquiry, RCI, to probe the issue. Kita akan bawa dalam kabinet. Ya, kalau nak, pasal ada cadangan semua buat RCI lah macam-macam kan. Tak boleh kita bawa. 
tidak ada itu Oh, nak kena bilang Kalau itu perkara yang besar Saya tak bisa sendiri lah Previously, IP88 had confirmed a cybersecurity incident involving card data of its users. The online payment portal reportedly said that since May 31st, it had been using cybersecurity experts to curb the issue. It also explained that an investigation was underway and that they were working closely with the authorities regarding the security breach. A total of 300,000 high-skilled job opportunities for youths in high-impact sectors such as electrical and electronics or ENE, automotive, chemicals and advanced materials will be as life sciences and medical technology are expected to be created by 2025. Senior International Trade and Industry Minister Dato Sri Muhammad Azmin Ali said for this year alone, a total of 20,000 similar job opportunities will be created through the Academy in Factory AIF programme. Dato Sri Azmin said that Malaysia is moving towards a productive developed country and thus, the local workforce should be prepared with higher skills that are suitable to meet the demands of the industry. He said the new high-skilled job opportunities created are for all youth groups, including for those in the rural areas, villages and the Orang Asli children. He added that to increase long-term competitiveness, the country needs to develop skilled, productive, creative and innovative human capital. On the more than 20,000 job opportunities to be created through the AIF program, Dato Sri Azmin explained that the program is an initiative by the Malaysian Productivity Corporation, MPC, to address the shortage of workers and develop high-skilled talents amongst local youths towards building a future-ready workforce. The initiative also demonstrated MPC's commitment in increasing productivity and competitiveness, based on the main drivers of productivity growth. The government is likely to set up a body to regulate political funding when the Bill on Political Donations is passed in Parliament. Minister in the Prime Minister's Department for Parliament and Law, Dato Sri Wan Junaidi Tuanku Jafa, said the proposed regulatory body will also decide on the contributors allowed, as well as the penalty against offenders under the proposed law. Dato Sri Wan Junaidi said he has since instructed the Legal Affairs Division of the Prime Minister's Department and Attorney General's Chambers to prepare a draft involving the administration of the proposed regulating body. In a statement, he said the draft will take into consideration the views and examples made by civil society organisations and non-governmental organisations. The proposal was discussed during a meeting he chaired on the political funding bill on Friday. The meeting was held between the National Centre for Governance, Integrity and Anti-Corruption, GIACC, the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, the Registrar of Societies, the Companies Commission of Malaysia, the Legal Affairs Division of the Prime Minister's Department and the Attorney General's Chambers. Dato Sri Wan Junaidi added, a Cabinet Minister's memorandum on the bill would be tabled during the weekly ministerial meeting next month. This, he said, was to expedite and ensure that the bill could be tabled during the October Dewan Rakyat sitting. He also stressed that he had instructed for the draft bill to be completed as soon as possible. The minister also informed that the government would carry out a comparative analysis on implementing the proposed law with those in place in other countries. Plans to transform Malaysia's education system are underway by ensuring that students in school learn to their best capabilities based on their own individual strengths. Senior Education Minister Dato Dr. Razi Jidin on Saturday said that he had been made aware that parents and teachers alike were worried about the abolishment of the UPSR and PTTIGA examinations. In his keynote speech at the Education Transformation Showcase in Alamanda Shopping Centre, Putrajaya, Dato Dr. Radzi said parents have nothing to worry about with the abolishment of the exams as the focus to score on exams would reduce and a more holistic approach and classroom learning focus regime would be the priority. This is to ensure that each individual student's strengths and weaknesses are properly addressed. 
Selama ini kita selalu bercakap tentang betapa kita masyarakat secara keseluruhannya terlalu memberi tumpuan kepada peperiksaan. Namun begitu kemajuan murid secara keseluruhannya itu tidak menjadi tumpuan utama. Sebab itu kita bincang apakah pendekatan yang kita ingin laksanakan. Dato Dr Razi also noted that with the abolishment of UPSR parents are worried about admissions into boarding schools asking which results would be used for these boarding schools to assess the students to this he said that the ministry has implemented the specific school administration assessment PKSK for students who were interested in attending these fully residential schools he added that in 2020 and 2021 only around 180,000 students have taken the PKSK exams to get spots in boarding schools. Dato Dr Radzi also stressed that with this new education system the ranking of students in classrooms after exams and the termination of the prestigious school's status have also been done away with. adding that a student's growth in schools will not merely be based on their year-end results he added that with the transformation the ministry will look at education as a whole as there is a need to have the will to properly educate and groom students to be the best versions of themselves and not pit them against each other On another matter, Dato Dr Radzi said his ministry expects to launch an online portal next week where members of the public will be able to report cases of bullying in schools. The portal will allow users to report cases of bullying anonymously either via email, the existing reporting system in the portal or through a hotline. Kita akan lancarkan uh, portal aduan buli ya untuk membolehkan uh, aduan ini disampaikan sama ada melalui email melalui pelaporan yang ada ataupun melalui panggilan telefon. Jadi kalau ada emergency berkaitan dengan buli ini, mesej yang nak disampaikan secara confidential, ada platform yang jelas untuk mereka sampaikan. He also expressed hope that with the portal, students will no longer be too scared of repercussions from reporting bullying cases. At the same time, he said the portal will allow anonymous reports to be made by either the parents, teachers or other students. who are aware of such cases besides the online portal dato dr razi said several initiatives have been put in place by the education ministry to tackle the bullying issue in malaysian schools including the establishment of a task force to look into the prevalence of bullying in schools responding to a query from the media over students who were alleged to have bullied and tormented a classmate at Mara Junior Science College MRSM in Kuantan he said that the case did not fall under his jurisdiction and that the relevant authorities will investigate the matter meanwhile Rural Development Minister Datuk Sri Mazze Khalid stressed that his ministry will not compromise with any MRSM student who is involved in acts of bullying. He said that if the disciplinary board ascertains that a student had indeed bullied another, he or she could be expelled. Buli ini adalah satu isu yang uh, serius dan uh, mengikut uh, apa nama peraturan standard standard uh, operating procedure di Mara uh, kita sebenarnya kita uh, buang ataupun kita memecat pelajar itu daripada belajar di Mak Tarnas Sains Mara insiden ini telah berlaku di Mak Tarnas Sains Mara di uh, Kepala Batas Pulau Pinang apabila ada pelajar-pelajar yang membuli pelajar lain He was asked about an alleged bullying case involving an MRSM student that went viral on social media recently. In the incident which allegedly took place at the MRSM in Kuantan, the victim is said to have had her uniform and hair cut while she was asleep in her dormitory. Dato Sri Madze, whose ministry oversees Mara Colleges, said the matter had been reported to the police who will carry out further investigations. 
In the meantime, the police have confirmed that they have received two reports on a bullying case involving a female student at the Kuantan MRSM. District Police Chief ACP One Mohammad Zahari Wan Busu said the reports were lodged by the school warden and the mother of the alleged victim. ACP One Zahari said police had received the two reports concerning the incident on August the 8th and 12th, with a probe opened under Section 427 of the Penal Code. The section concerns offences of mischief and causing losses or damage, which carries a jail term of one to five years or a fine upon conviction. He added that police are currently investigating every angle related to the case. Earlier, the mother of the alleged victim took to Facebook on Friday with a timeline of what her daughter allegedly experienced. She claimed that her daughter had been bullied and harassed by an individual since June this year, where school uniforms belonging to the 14-year-old as well as other students had been cut and torn. She also claimed that school authorities blamed her daughter for this even though she was a victim in the incident. She shared photos of the damaged uniforms as well as a photo of locks of hair belonging to the teen that had been cut while she was asleep. More local updates later in the bulletin, but first, Indonesia's Prabowo declares a 2024 presidential bid. Stay with us. Prabowo Subianto has declared his entry into the country's presidential race in 2024, his third bid for the top job in one of the world's largest democracies. Prabowo, who leads Indonesia's third largest party, Gerindra, announced his intention in a briefing after a party meeting on late Friday. The 70-year-old announced his candidacy more than 18 months ahead of the elections to capitalise on popular support while he remains in President Joko Widodo's government. Meanwhile, Jokowi, who is constitutionally barred from seeking a third term due to the two-term limits, approve of Prabowo's candidacy. Polling in recent months has shown that Prabowo is amongst the top three potential candidates alongside Central Java Governor Ganjar Pranowo and Governor of the capital Jakarta, Anis Baswedan. On Saturday, Gerindra and Partai Kebangkitan Bangsa, one of the nation's largest Muslim-based parties, have declared a political alliance, becoming the second such col collaboration announced for the 2024 elections. The controversial author Salman Rushdie remains on a ventilator after being attacked at an event in the western New York state on Friday morning. According to officials, the 75-year-old was stabbed in the neck and torso as he was about to give a lecture on stage at Chautauqua Institution. It was understood that the author also suffered a wound to his liver and might lose an eye in the wake of the knife attack. Authorities later identified the man suspected of stabbing Rushdi as 24-year-old Hadi Mata of Fairview, New Jersey, who had bought a pass to the event. Police, however, said the motive for the attack was unclear. Previously, Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses, had been banned in Iran since 1988 as the book portrayed a fictionalized version of the Prophet Muhammad and an interpretation of the Al-Quran that caused a stir in the Muslim community.
The FBI agents in this week's search of former U.S. President Donald Trump's Florida home have removed 11 sets of classified documents, including some marked as top secret. According to the Justice Department, it had probable cause to conduct the search based on a possible Espionage Act violation. Now, the search was carried out as part of a federal investigation into whether Trump illegally removed documents when he left office in January 2021 after losing the presidential election two months earlier to Democrat Joe Biden. The Espionage Act, one of three laws cited in the warrant application, makes it a crime to release information that could harm national security. Hence, the removal of classified documents or materials is prohibited by law. Meanwhile, Trump who is now punishable by up to five years in prison, had denied any wrongdoing, saying the records were all declassified and placed in secure storage. Although the FBI carted away material labelled as classified, the three laws cited as the basis for the warrant make it a crime to mishandle government records regardless of whether they are classified. As such, Trump's claims that he declassified the documents would have no bearing on the potential legal violations at issue. On to sports. The government plans to build a drag racing circuit in all states to enhance development of motorsports in the country. Dato Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob said the proposal would be included in the 2023 budget to be tabled this October. In the opening of the 2022 RXZ Members 4.0 program at the Trungano International Drag Strip in Gongbada on Saturday, the Prime Minister said two drag circuits have been built so far in Trungano and Malacca. He said with the facilities available, it would give youths the opportunity to participate in motorsports activities through proper channels. Dato Sri Ismail Sabri also called on the young people to participate in the My Fit at Motorsports 2022, which is a grassroots motoring development program organized by the Youth and Sports Ministry. 
The government would also always support activities by motoring clubs, especially in helping those affected by hardships, such as the flood victims. Turning to tennis now, the 2022 Canadian Open. Beatrice Adachmaya came from behind to beat Belinda Bencic in three sets to reach the semi-finals. The serving Adach took two hours and 11 minutes to win against the 12th seeded Bencic, 2-6, 6-3, 6-3. Adach will play against Karolina Pliskova in the next round. The former world number one earlier took two hours and 34 minutes to beat Qin Wenzhen of China in three sets, 4-6, 6-4, 6-4. <laughs> also in the last four was Simona Halib. Facing Coco Golf of the United States, Halib clinched a 6-4, 7-6 win in an hour and 49 minutes. She will next face Jessica Pagula of the United States for a place in the final. Coming up after the break, fire breaks out at condo construction site. Stay tuned. Raja Permaisuri Agong Tunku Haja Aziza Amina Maimuna Iskandaria on Saturday opened the International Islamic University Malaysia IIUM's 37th Convocation Ceremony with a call to graduates to use their knowledge and values to help shape the world. Her Majesty the Queen also urged the graduates to embrace the values that they have gained from the university on their new journey. I ardently hope that this institution has moulded you in becoming a person of Kair, intellectuals who are the cutting edge in every discipline of knowledge, offering solutions and breakthroughs. I wish you nothing but the best in your next endeavours. At the convocation, Tunku Aziza, who is also the IIUM constitutional head, awarded Orang Besar Daerah Gomba Tan Sri Wan Mahmud Pawante an honorary doctorate in community transformation and Islamic da'wah for his service and dedication to community development. The late Dr. Robert Dixon Crane, who was known by his Muslim name, Farooq Abs al Haq, was posthumously awarded a PhD in Civilization Dialogue. A total of 6,638 graduates received their scrolls, each covering 14 kudiyas and three institutes of the various levels of study. The convocation is scheduled to last for six days with 12 sessions until next Thursday.
In the capital, a fire broke out on the 37th floor of the Platinum Arena condominium construction site at Jalan Klang Lama on Saturday. According to the Kuala Lumpur Fire and Rescue Department Operations Commander, Mohamed Faizul Nizam Daram, they received an emergency call about the fire at 1.50 p.m. and rushed to the scene. It was said that checks revealed that a stack of planter cell cement had caught fire on the topmost floor of the condominium, which was still under construction. However, no casualties were reported and no one was injured in the incident. Fifteen firemen, two fire engines, a FRT crane and one EMRS were involved in the operation. The 22nd edition of the Flower Carpet Festival in Belgium are opting for more heat-resistant blooms to adapt to Europe's heatwave. Returning to Belgian capital's opulent Grand Place after a COVID-imposed absence, this year's design is put together by more than 120 volunteers who placed more than 400,000 begonias in approximately four hours. Let's take a look at the festival as we wrap up Nightline this time around. With that, I'm Adrian Seat. Thank you for watching and stay safe, Malaysia.